Hello Revolution students and welcome back to my series of videos on China area of study one. Uh, this video is devoted to the warlord period so that period in China's history from 1916 to 1927 and it began, we're going to go through the key points, it began with the death of Yuan Shikai. Yuan Shikai was the only leader in China at that time with the authority to and power to hold all of China together. Upon his death, China fragmented into small states run by uh, pretty much independent warlords. And the warlords had their own armies and so forth. Some states, or these, some of these areas run controlled by these warlords, some were ruled okay. Many were not though. So, um, and there was still a, there was still a sort of a quasi government in Beijing, but that was controlled by various warlords. And these warlords themselves were former generals of uh, Yuan Shikai. So we can see that that pretty much summarizes that first point. The second point there within their provinces, these warlords were autocrats, so they totally controlled everything within the provinces that they controlled. They administered their own uh, legal systems, and. They, um, they taxed the peasants as they willed, and they ran the financial systems. Uh, actual, the British and French and other foreign powers uh, made treaties with these warlords as well, some of them, whichever ones they felt were the most, uh, most powerful at the time. Another uh, significant point about this warlord period is that warlord rule led to uh, disunity in China which is quite obvious. So warlords formed fighting warlords enabled foreign powers to um, expand and increase their control within China. Um, for the Chinese people itself, themselves, uh, they had a mixed and varied experience of warlord rule. What it did do for that social group, the intellectuals, they were angry that uh, the republic that had been set up and then suddenly pretty much it collapsed with the death of Yuan Shikai. They were angry that uh, firstly the foreigners were expanding their control in China and they were angry that our warlords were ruling China. And as a consequence, this, this intellectual movement uh, rose amongst Chinese intellectuals, Chinese students, university students, centered, one of the centered around pretty much Beijing University and this uh, intellectual uh, and literary movement was known as the New Culture Movement. And it's also connected to the May 4th Movement, which we'll uh, look at in coming slides. So uh, a significant consequence of the warlord uh, period was that uh, it created these two, the New Culture Movement and the May 4th Movement. Another uh, significant consequence of the warlord movement, a warlord period, sorry, was that it united two revolutionary parties, the Guomindang, who had formed um, uh, in 1912 from the old uh, Sun Yixian's old uh, Tong Minghui revolutionary group, as well as some of the other smaller uh, revolutionary parties. Um, so the uh, united the Guomindang, who by this stage were located down in Guangzhou province um, and in Hong Kong, and the CCP. And the CCP was a very small revolutionary party at this stage. It united them um, and because they had a common enemy, the warlords. And the third member of the group who formed the first united front, you can see there um, in this point here, the first united front was the Comintern. So uh, contributed to the formation of the first united front between the Comintern, the GMD and the CCP. The common turn was that uh, Russian communist government agency whose purpose was to uh, promote and support international revolution outside Bolshevik revolution, communist revolution outside of Russia. For those of you who'd studied the Russian revolution and go back to uh, the Treaty of Riga, which was signed between uh, Russia and Poland, um, in 1921, that pretty much put an end to uh, communist Bolshevik 
Russian Bolshevik communist attempts to spread international or spread revolution to Europe. And after the Treaty of Riga, uh, the Bolsheviks turned their heads east and looked east to uh, spread revolution. And China was one place where they were quite successful in spreading communist revolution outside of Russia. So this first united front was this alliance between those. And it's interesting that the Comintern um, and the Russians, they supported both the Kuomintang and the CCP and uh, Stalin did in particular. And even even up until the 19th, you know, um, 19, you know, late 1920s and so forth, they were still supporting the GMD, the Russians. So sometimes at uh, the cost of the, you know, almost the death of the CCP, but we'll get to that. So they're the, the, uh, the key, I suppose, the key points, the significant points related to the warlord period. Um, if you are writing about the warlords and you have a question on the exam about the warlords, it's also good to, uh, if you can, give specific examples about one or two warlords. So I'll put some down here. So I'm just going to go through these quickly. So examples of warlords, and I've got three. So I've got Feng Guozhang, who was one of Yuan Shikai's lieutenants. He became vice president of the Republic and, cro and controlled Gansu province. Zhang Shun supported the old Manchu dynasty. He tried to restore Puyi to the throne in 1917 and he was based in Shandong province. Then we're going to learn more about Shandong province. So at this time, Shandong province, um, many of its mining rights and uh, sort of, I suppose, economic rights were controlled by the Germans. Okay. Um, and there's a, there's a bit of a tussle for control over Shandong province after World War I when the Germans are forced to, when they're defeated in World War I between uh, the Chinese and the Japanese, but we'll get to that. So Shandong province, and Shandong province is um, in the northeast, uh, just sort of south of Korea. So we'll get to that. And then finally, the third warlord, Shan Yish, uh, Yan Yishan, he, uh, he's, I suppose he's the best of these three, okay? So the first two were um, the classic sort of warlords who were more concerned about their own uh, wealth and power than, um, the, I suppose, uh, the lives of the people who they uh, ruled in their, their chosen provinces. But Yan Shishan, he introduced uh, progressive policies such as industrial training schemes and tried to improve the quality of local services in Shanxi province. Uh, and he must have been very popular because he controlled that province from 1912 right up to 1949. He was one of the longest surviving warlords. I think he actually uh, eventually became a, a CCP general or a high ranking, he, he allied with the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, and there is a there is a photo of Feng Guozhang, and here is a quote here about how uh, just gives an account of how the Chinese people felt about warlord rule. Poor people of Sichuan, Sichuan's in the west. For ten years now, we have suffered the scourge of militarism, more destructive than the floods, more destructive than the floods. Ah, these military governors and their officers, the warlords, and the armies are continually recruiting men and the people become poorer and poorer. Where it passed, nothing grows. Where they've passed, nothing grows but brambles. This is the case with us, where armies pass through again and again. Our situation has become intoler intolerable. And that's one of the victims of the warlords. Okay, so that's your the key points for the warlords. Let's just have a look now at some historical interpretations related to the warlord period. So I've got two here. The first one is by Michael Lynch, and they are contra uh, contrasting historical interpretations about the warlord rule. So the first one is, the common Chinese experience of warlord rule was one of oppression and terror. Civil society had collapsed. And if we just look back at that quote uh, we just went through, um, it tallies with that. This second historical interpretation from, by John King Fairbank, all in all, warlordism was a strangely limited kind of disorder. It did not vitally affect the foreignized ur modern urban fringe of China. So we're talking pl about places like Shanghai. Nor did it hit directly the great peasant mass in villages, not on the line of march. 
Um, so he's arguing, uh, John King Fairbank is arguing, it didn't really affect the people in the cities that much. The real big metrop prop metropolises like uh, Shanghai, Hong Kong um, and Beijing. And it didn't really affect the peasants that much. Um, Lynch is arguing the opposite. And if we look at the uh, new culture movement and so forth, the intellectuals obviously believe that um, warlord rule was one of oppression and terror. And we'll see that when we look at uh, their criticisms of the warlords. So anyway, um, I hope you found this useful and I will see you next time. Goodbye.